Saska. And I'm Sylvia Saska. And we're the Saska Sisters. And this is Indie Horror Junkie. Indie Horror Junkie. Is he horror junkie? Indie horror junkie. 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 We're a panic attack. And this is Indie horror junkie. Woo! Indie horror junkie. 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 It's the Indie Horror Junkie Podcast, your source for anything and everything indie horror. Here's your host, Otis P. Dreads. I'm back. It's 8 o'clock. Do you know where your indie horror is? It is indeed right here, the Indie Horror Junkie Podcast. I am back. I'm feeling a lot better than I was last week. Uh, thank you, uh, Rotting Ricky, and of course, Asylum Amy, for taking the helms and uh, helping me out there. But it's good to be back. How are you, sir? How are you doing tonight? Uh, doing really good. I'm uh, really excited about our guest tonight and uh, excited about some stuff that we got coming up and can't wait to kick this baby off. That's right. Uh, we are exactly a week away from issue eight. I believe it is. And uh ooh, I can't wait for this one. Uh you guys, you guys are really gonna like it, of course. You know, there are little perks to being the host of the indie horror junkie podcast. I get a little sneak peek before anybody else, but hey, that's just that's just the perks that come with the territory. It's okay. Yeah, don't, don't 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 feel bad. But you you guys are really gonna dig this. Uh on the cover uh this issue, of course, uh Mr. Uh, Peter Anthony, his new project called Laugh looks uh, pretty damn terrifying. If, if you ask me, that's some pretty, that's some pretty cool makeup. Uh, is that like a clown or something? Is that what that's supposed to be? I'm yeah, guessing something. with the title of Laugh, we have some kind of uh, probably a demented clown. Can't wait to see it. Uh, welcome. Uh, Kelly has, has joined us. Welcome, Kelly. Uh, and I am tonight monitoring both because sometimes uh you know people joining us on facebook and uh and youtube so sometimes their name don't come up on my stream yard but i got it right over here i'm ready today i missed a week i thought i was going to forget how to do this but not so much so yes issue i'm rambling here i'm excited to be back issue eight uh next wednesday get on over there to the indie horror junk indie horror junkie.com you see all the links down there uh, get over there and uh, you kind of redesign the, the the home page there. So it's very accessible to get your hands on uh, a hard copy so you can read it while you're taking a poop. Maybe, maybe, you know? maybe. I mean, mm -hmm. hey, if you need your indie horror that bad, if you're that bad of a junkie that you can't wait till you get off the commode. Well, we're glad we're glad you are. But and we don't need to know where you read it, but read it. Check it mm -hmm. out. You can get your hard copy the day that the uh, digital version uh, drops. So, hey, it's all there, man. Uh, let us know what you think. And you can do that by the Gmail that just scrolled across the bottom, in the order junkie at gmail.com. And, and since we're going to be having our podcast on the day of the issue release, we'll even do something a little cool where anybody who's actually watching and listening in on will put a little indie horror trivia question out there. And whoever gets it right, We'll send them a free copy. How about that? Bam. Oh, look at that. Look at that. Mm -hmm. Yep. So, and and you may want to repeat that later on as people are just now coming in. So, uh, I will. For, you know, for anybody. Yes. Yeah. So, and if you're watching, if you happen to be watching, 
between now and next Wednesday, maybe, you know, you didn't catch the live. Mm -hmm. uh, make sure. Make sure you're there. We're going to test your indie horror knowledge for some free swag. Absolutely. Going to be awesome. Going to yep. be awesome. So, uh, you know, I really should have uh, asked how to pronounce the last name properly. <laughs> I believe it's Larry Fassenden. I was going to say Fassenden. Okay. I was going to say and I, I I was going to tell him when we were talking, chatting just before, you know, we went live. I was going to tell him, hey, you know, you look a lot like Jack Nicholson. Mm -hmm. I'm sure, I, I'm it sure, almost, I'm sure I it's swear, not the first time he's heard that. There's no way it could be. Yeah. So, uh, and he's got, he's got a, a new project called Blackout coming mm -hmm. out. A new spin on an old tale. Yes, it's a werewolf movie. Mm, love werewolf movies. Love werewolf movies. Uh, so uh, you guys check this out. When we come back, we're going to be talking with Larry about his latest project. So much more. Stay tuned. This is Blackout. Is that it, Charlie? You out of here? No, I just needed a spot for the month. Girl, I'm heading over. I got to make a couple quick stops, and then I'll be there. Tell me what's on your mind. I wanted to ask if you'd take a look at some of these papers I found in my dad's estate about Jack Hammond. The guy behind the Hilltop Resort project? He is such a corrupting force in this town. I want to see him behind bars. If you want to delve deeper, I can show you the way. No, I'll be gone. Sharon? What's up? Sorry, I'm late. I'm leaving, you know, for good. I wanted to say goodbye. Where are you going to go? Outside the studio. I woke up in the woods, this big gash on my neck. And then I saw it, this full moon. I was separating from myself. That's when I realized I wasn't me anymore. It's been three months since that night, and every full moon since, and the night before, and the night after. Total blackout. <laughs> It's all the excitement. And they found another body up in Briar Woods last night. Everyone needs to go home. There's something out there on the loose and dangerous. What'd you see that man? I saw a monster. You seem a little wounded. What's really going on with you? I can't say. Stuart? You're really a werewolf. I'd rather be dead. Charlie! Charlie! Stay with me, man! I can't wait to see your face when you realize what's happening. <laughs> If there's something the world needs more of, it's werewolf movies. There, there's not enough out there. Welcome to the show, Larry. That was a that was a great looking trailer. How are you this evening? I am great, guys. Good to see you all. Nice to be on the show. Awesome. Well, we're going to talk. Uh, it said, you know, as everybody saw in the trailer, it said uh, the indie horror maestro. <laughs> Come on, uh, what, tell, tell us a little bit about that because you have i mean i was looking at your imd you have 120 plus acting credits i mean i could just go through all of them you're a jack of all trades speaking of jack jack torrance yes there it is there it is i i love it you you had to have heard that so many times yeah i heard it a lot uh yeah it just happened uh, yesterday, I don't even know what I was doing, but uh, oh, I was at the dentist, <laughs> and uh, the nurse or whatever they're called, she was uh, she was saying, she was saying, I love the shine, um, but yeah, it happens all the time. It's almost a curse, but of course, I have a great fondness for Nicholson. I grew up loving him, all his seventies movies, and then The Shining. So, 
Uh, you could do a lot worse, but it's kind of funny. No. I mean, at no, the airport, no, no. It, should, it should very much be taken as a uh, as as a compliment. Now, talk to us about this werewolf movie, Blackout. Let, let's talk about that. Uh, so yeah, it's called Blackout. I made it, uh, I guess, a couple years ago, uh, coming out of COVID, and um, it's uh, fairly low budget. It stars Alex Hurt, uh, who is William Hurt's son. Oh. William Hurt which is really cool. And he's a great uh, soulful character and he plays kind of an alcoholic who's a little on the outs and he's convinced that at night he turns into a werewolf uh, in this small town. So it's kind of about small town politics and how we all play the blame game and this guy's feeling of guilt and he connects with various people over the course of the movie and uh, tries to resolve his problems. So it's, uh, you know, I make these kind of low-key atmospheric horror movies. And, uh, you know, I put the werewolf in the trailer, the werewolf's in the, uh, on the poster. I'm not shy about what I'm about. Uh, and then you go and you have an experience. And my, my approach to horror is sort of like, what would it really be like? So I don't come in with uh, big guns and... Um, try to dazzle people i try to creep in slowly and and really uh kind of have an atmospheric vibe so that's just my angle that's my approach and yeah you're right i have uh very kindly been referred to as a maestro and a maverick and an icon and a legend and all of this the real reason is that uh also in the 90s and onwards i've produced a lot of movies and I discovered Ty West. I discovered Jim Mickle who went on to make a uh, stake land. I've been an actor in all kinds of things very often. I mean, yeah, I got over a hundred titles, but sometimes I just come on for three minutes and then get killed. Uh, like uh, the movie you're next, for example, by Adam Wingard. Uh, I'm just the <laughs> opening kill. Um, I get to have sex very quickly and then uh, get uh, stabbed. So, you know, I, uh, I mean, not a, a bad point, gig, really. No, no, nothing to bat an eye at. I mean, not not a problem, if you ask me. What a way to go, in fact. Uh, <laughs> I think people just uh, started liking seeing me killed, and it was a way to support young <laughs> filmmakers, like maybe um, someone starting out would, would conceive of this uh, scene for me, and I'd, I'd try to show up if it was possible. I'm a big fan of... Uh, of why horror is so cool is that you can make a low budget horror movie. You don't need big stars because the genre is the, is the star, you know, uh, you're making a zombie movie, a ghost story, a werewolf movie, Frankenstein, what have you. Uh, it's going to be, um, palatable because of the way you tell, uh, the, the, the genre, uh, you know, so you don't need a name. Whereas if you're making a comedy or a, a romantic comedy or something like that, you're going to maybe need a star to keep people interested. The horror fans are the best. They're the most loyal. They're the most engaged, the most curious. I've been to all the festivals over the years and uh, and all the conventions back in the day. And, uh, yeah, I just really feel a great kinship to to people who see the world through the dark lens, you know. <laughs> there, you, there, there you go. So I'm, I'm assuming, uh, and I could be wrong, but I'm assuming you start. did you start out acting first? Uh, you know, was that first in line for... That's absolutely right. Uh, in fact, all the way back to high school, I thought I would just be an actor, but I got a little big for my britches and I started thinking, well, maybe I'll put on a show. And uh, and then um, I got editing equipment and I started working with uh, performance artists. I live in New York City, so I'm a New Yorker. And, uh, and I started working with the downtown scene and, you know, the crossover with the the, the music scene and what was going on in the clubs in the nineties, I guess, and the, even the eighties. So I'm an old timer for one thing, <laughs> uh, but uh, that was the way it went. And uh, we had a lot of fun. It was also this uh, dawning of the idea of video. Uh, I was very, very lucky to get older and make movies on, uh, on celluloid. My first film habit. Uh, well, my first film was no telling habit. Uh, Wendigo. These were all made in, in, in film. But before that, I was shooting features on video um, and that was uh, I realized, Oh my God, you can make movies almost for nothing. So this is an aesthetic that I developed. And then over the years uh, I would try to inspire young filmmakers. And that's how I met Ty West. He was a, uh, he was an intern 
at my little company. I mean, my company was just <laughs> me in a dungeon. I guess you guys know the vibe or a basement, I should say. Uh, and, uh, with some editing equipment. And, uh, so Ty showed up and before long I was working for him. He had things he needed to fix on his short movies. And I was very impressed with his skills. So, uh, I said, well, listen, kid, when you get out of college, you come and knock on my door and maybe we'll try to set you up with a feature of some sort. Well, he did. And, uh, and so this is sort of how it developed. I started working with young first time filmmakers who were very, very grateful to have a small amount of money. And this was back in the day when you could, uh, you could turn around a profit on a, on a small film because there were so many, you know, there was video, there was uh, TV rights, foreign, of course, if you were able to get into that vibe, but uh, no matter what you were really, there was potential. And, and so I was able to produce a lot of movies and that's where my real status as a, as a, a, an entity in the business came from because uh, my own films are quite subtle and they're not for every taste, you know, uh, but all along I was also doing my thing. And, and so the two things went together. I mean, not everybody likes Ty West. He's considered a slow burn filmmaker. Right. So uh, we had that in common sort of appreciating trying to find the horror in the everyday life, you know, as opposed to just coming at people with, uh, the bold story. So, um, uh, the, the, whatever, that's the vibe. So that's my company. And it went on from there. What, uh, you know, you said you, you, you know, you kind of, uh, you know, help young filmmakers, you know, along the way and whatnot, which I, I think is absolutely amazing because it seems to be a staple in the indie, indie community, indie horror community. There's been, you know, so many helping hands willing to, you know, help somebody make a dream come true. I've seen it firsthand and I've been a part of it firsthand. Uh, talk to us a little bit about because, you know, for those here live, for those going to watch on the, you know, the replay, we get a lot of uh, young filmmakers, you know, looking for a little bit of inspiration. Maybe they're a little down because they don't realize they can make something with very little you there you know so and and that could discourage you know i think a lot of you know first time filmmakers so what would you have to say to that if if a young filmmaker came up to you and said man i just don't know if i can do this x y and z is holding me back what kind of inspiration would you give them uh yeah i would absolutely lean into the fact that uh you know nowadays more than ever you're not even trying to develop your film in a lab uh, you have your equipment, and I could argue that you have your cell phone. What you yeah. need is a vision and a purpose, and you need to have a story. It's not just I want to make a horror movie so that I can get famous and, you know, get on indie horror junkie. Fuck that, man. It's got to be because you got something to say, a story to tell. Maybe there's some darkness in your own life, and you're going to express it with this wonderful genre that, you know, can deal with a lot of real issues, uh, and yet in in a fun way because of the metaphor because of the the you know maybe you're going to have a, a monster and the makeup and the creativity that comes with uh with with horror in particular you know i don't mm. want to see a sad sack story about an alcoholic but i might watch a movie about a a werewolf if i knew that there was a metaphor in play you know what i'm saying so mm -hmm. uh, i'm just saying um i would tell the kids first of all find your community find your your pals your support system get a bunch of kids who, who love the same stuff as you and really plan it out and, and scheme and don't worry about money and don't spend all your time saying, if only I had a, a famous actor or if only I had more money from old uncle Stan, maybe we can push him down the stairs. <laughs> you know, you got to, uh, <laughs> or uncle Stan. What do I know? Do? I know. I don't know what it is about uncle Stan. <laughs> I, he's just like got a kick me sign on his back, <laughs> but, um, you know, just kind of, um, get busy is what I'm saying. And, and, you know, I mean, the real problem now is actually distribution. And to that, I don't have an answer, but yeah. you can't be doing this uh, for the fame and fortune that may come. And that would be glorious if you have a style or a point of view that really sticks with people. But once again, you know, you have to build your, your, 
your community and your your uh, oeuvre, if you will. <laughs> and, you yeah. know, make posters. Think about the imagery that goes with your movie. And, you know, you, you build your own. You know, I come from a generation we had the horror magazines. Well, you guys are doing that. That's why, mm -hmm. that's why I'm here, because you guys have a, a magazine. That's so cool. And in the old days, you'd go and you'd buy your famous monsters of Filmland or your Fangoria or what mm -hmm. have you. And uh, it was really, really meaningful because you'd look through the pages. You might not even see these movies, but you saw the photos and, and you started getting that your imagination was uh, stimulated. So I'm just saying, uh, you know, understand the graphics and all the different things that contribute to the, the life of a movie. The, the reason we love these movies is, is, is the graphics. I mean, I'm looking at Elsa Lanchester and Lon Chaney senior behind your back Otis and what could be more glorious. Those images stay with, I'm, I'm 60 years old. They still make me happy. Uh, yeah. That whole uh, family of monsters from the universal movies. And in a way that's what I'm doing. I'm kind of doing a callback to those and yet putting it in a modern sensibility. So I kind of um, got that from, from the trailer. And I was going to ask you if that, you know, if, if Wolfman was maybe a favorite of yours, or you just seen that there wasn't a whole lot of, you know, damn werewolf movies out there. So, and you had an idea, which one is it? You, you a fan of, uh, I think you're a fan of Juan Jr. Anyway, I'm a fan of, uh, of Wolfman. I love Wolfman. I love Frankenstein. I've made a Frankenstein movie also called depraved. And that is, uh, you know, I'm not, I'm not in the business of tributing these movies, but they're in my bloodstream. So yeah, yeah. Uh, if, uh, if I make a werewolf movie, because I wanted to be a werewolf when I was a kid, uh, I'm going to call on, on some of those older imagery. I mean, of course, I love The Howling. I love uh, American Werewolf in London and, uh, and Dog Soldiers, uh, you know, uh, Curse of the Werewolf, Oliver Reed it's all good stuff and um it's all part of my my joy and love of these creatures but uh yeah i i do go all the way back to wolfman because you got to know i think in your childhood the 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 impressions you have those are the ones that strike you the strongest and and you know we're i'm not looking at 1941 wolfman as some cheesy mm -hmm. you know movie oh. as a kid i'm 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 seeing a guy turning into a werewolf. He's got problems. His dad is a problem. <laughs> uh, I'm totally in it to win it. Uh, Maria Ospenskaya, you know, with her poetry and uh, this stuff struck. So that's what I carry into the future. And so I'm not making fun of those movies, which are a little creaky. I'm in fact, just amazed that they still have that power. You look at Frankenstein yeah. walking out of the, of the dungeon and you're just like, that image is as cool as any pop image that's been created. I mean, uh, maybe we have Heath Ledger as the Joker. You know, we have a couple of beautiful things. The obviously the alien uh, and and the makeup from the thing or the the effects, but but these are still beautiful rarities and they stick with you for life. And so that's the thing I'm I'm trying to uh, embrace as I make my own little pictures. That's my little picture, see? Hey? Yep. <laughs> well, what's your what's your favorite uh, uh, werewolf tramp transformation scene? <laughs> well, that's a funny question. You know, I was actually talking about werewolves. <laughs> funnily, funnily enough, and some kid or whoever it was, they pointed out that the werewolf in um, the Harry Potter, the third Harry Potter, is really cool. So, you know, that's what's fun. There's always these random. Uh, uh, werewolf movies or werewolf incidents and you're like oh yeah that that was cool like that's a cool werewolf because it's seen from far away and it's very embedded in the story right but you know i don't know i was intrigued by the wolfman uh transformations we all mm -hmm. know they were just yes. uh uh done with uh time kind of, lapse. Kind of stuff yeah and and yeah. jack pierce and all that and lon cheney was always very bitchy about it all he was not gracious like uh, karloff but no. um, so there's that. I know from a Monster Squad, one of my makeup guys loves. There's uh, the dude is in the in the phone booth, and they use these dollies. So there's a lot of uh, different. There, there are a lot of fun ones, and then we obviously have to love the uh, American Werewolf in London. But that's my favorite. I mean, yeah. of course, it's just it's magnificent. And at the time, I mean, I was in the theater 
maybe day one. And, and that was pretty uh, mind altering at the time. But I do think no. that it's, you know, the story is that, uh, well, no, it's actually the howling, but um, uh, uh, whatever his name is, Joe Dante said, here's an example of what we intend to do. And the, uh, the suits loved it so much, they wouldn't let him cut it. And so even now he admits that the, the sequence goes on for so long because the woman's just standing there. <laughs> the guy's like, <laughs> <laughs> it's like you know, tick tock, tick tock. She could have run away. <laughs> paralyzed with fear is the way I like to think about it. There you go, paralyzed with fear, as we all are. <laughs> yes, yes. Those are my two favorite movies for sure. To me, American Wolf in London has always been my favorite. I'm a filmmaker myself, and I wrote a script for a werewolf movie called Lycanthrope. And what I did was, because I used to watch all the movies, read all the books, and I put in like what you were saying, put you know your life and thoughts and the things that affected you when you were young. So in my script, I tried to do everything that I've always wanted to see happen in a werewolf movie, but never saw it. Yeah. So I'm hoping one day to get that made and I'm really excited about that. But that's what intrigued me so much about yours because I've been a big fan of your work. I, I was showing you earlier that uh, this movie right here is the first movie I think I've seen from yours. And a friend of mine, Marcus Koch, he's the one that did the effects uh, for yeah, your movie. Yeah, he made a fake head for me. Yeah. But this movie was really well done. But one of the things I've noticed, and I haven't seen um, House of the Devil yet that I want to see now, and but I have seen Stakeland. Stakeland's a favorite of mine too. Love but State especially, Land. yeah, I love Stakeland. But especially with the We Are Still Here, I really got that '70s vibe from that movie. The whole way it was not only was it shot, the pacing of it, the costuming, and everything else. It just was so well done. It really brought me back to that yeah. age where I really got into horror movies. And I loved, I really loved that movie so much. And your character was really, to me, your character was the one that made it fun. <laughs> yeah, well, uh, so that was made by Ted Gagan and produced mm -hmm. by Travis Stevens. Both guys are uh, active in the horror world. Uh, Ted, uh, that was his, uh, yeah, I think it was his first movie. But he's a publicist and he's a great, he's a writer of a lot of uh, horror stuff. Anyway, it was obviously very uh, lovingly created and had that 70s vibe. Yep. And I get to be kind of a, yeah, my favorite thing is when uh, I'm like rolling a joint and the red mm -hmm. square, uh, the couple that's hosting me. And uh, that was uh, Tim Burton's ex-wife, um, uh, Lisa Marie was in there. Right. Um, and uh, we're just playing sort of these goofy friends and we show up. But then I get involved in a seance uh, with the husband of the, the sad couple. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, and then the shit hits the fan and I become demonic and I swallow a sock. Famously. I was going to say that got intense. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And uh, I do all kinds of nasty things. And then I, I, I can't remember. Oh yeah. Well, I off myself on camera and that's when Marcus comes into uh, play. So uh, that was really fun. It was really cold February and way, way upstate New York. And uh, just one of those very intimate uh labors of love everybody was great of course barbara crampton is the the real star of that movie and so it was great to meet her and and we've worked together on many things since including uh jacob's wife where i play her husband but uh yeah i i love we are still here and i'm also in ted's next film called uh well his recent film called brooklyn 45 and that's a whole other vibe it's kind of a 1940s ghost story, another seance movie. In fact, people like the seance scene from We Are Still Here so much that they told Ted, we want a whole movie like that. So <laughs> he, uh, he delivered. That was and a standout scene. What they want, as they say, you know. Yeah, exactly. You got to give them what they want, man. <laughs> That's it. So, yeah. I mean, what, what, I'm sorry. Did you have another question, Rick? Well, I was going to say kind of a question that we talk about all the time and we ask a lot of people here. Because you've got so many movies under your belt, not just acting, but directing, producing, and everything. What is it, since you've had a chance to dip your toes into each of those ponds, which role do you like most? Do you like being in front of the camera, bringing a particular character to life, or do you like sitting in the director's chair and basically overseeing an entire project and making it happen? Well, if you see a movie called Habit, I do everything, including um, the main character. <laughs> but, um, you know... I, I think in the end, you want to tell your own stories just because you have this slight angle on how you want to deal with uh, the material right. that we all love and everyone has an angle 
like you say, you have a, a werewolf story you've you've put together and you weren't ready to film. You know that feeling. You're just like, I just want to get this on camera. It doesn't mean I don't love and appreciate being an actor is great. You get to get on other people's sets. You get to sort of learn from them, either be inspired or take note of what you absolutely would never do, <laughs> whatever it is. Uh, that's a real privilege. Um, and, you know, it's a somewhat of an immediate pleasure to act. But um, in the end, I want to tell my stories. And, and so I like to direct. And when I direct, it's usually uh, I work at a low budget, mostly because I have to. I don't have access to bigger money. I've tried many times to break into Hollywood. But in the end, I also like the freedom. I don't want a bunch of suits telling me what to do. And uh, right. this stuff is pretty personal. You know, you live with a movie for three years in the making, but often many, many years before that trying to put it together. So, uh, you know, I take it seriously. It's, a, it's a, an expression of something that's personal and you're also trying to maybe solve the problems of the world or at least solve the problems of somebody's quiet night at home uh you know give them an hour and a half of uh of a jolt so i want to do it uh my way and i also love editing because in a way i'm a loner uh despite being fairly gregarious in the end i just want to be in the dark room with the material and shaping it and getting into that vibe you know so that's the word Oh yes. Uh, what what do you got? Uh, you know, coming up. When is is blackout out? Blackout. Is no. Blackout is, is uh, coming out in New York City on uh, uh, March thirteenth. So that's a week from this very night. Yeah. And we have a couple of Q and As and a couple of drinks afterwards, and uh, and that'll be really fun. It's at a theater in New York City called IFC, so that'll be grand. And then, uh, and then we sort of roll out across the country like an old uh, circus act. You know, we're going to get to L.A. Uh, April 11th, I think, but we're, we're trying to hit Chicago. Uh, we're going to be at the uh, Overlook, Overlook Film Festival in, um, in New Orleans uh, on April 4th. So this and that, you know, this isn't a big release, uh, but uh, finally we'll be on streaming April 12th. And then from there, you know, we get into the bloodstream of uh, the regular home viewers. But it'll be nice to try a few theatrical uh, spaces, and uh, we're we're still setting that up. Now so, I know what, that what, what I know, do you, what do you, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Rick. I was going to say I know that uh, the the I don't know. I guess the playing field has changed now, especially since COVID and stuff like that. Like we were talking about. Um, and and as being a filmmaker, I've noticed this a lot. They don't give minimum guarantees anymore with the streaming services and everything else. It's really hard to make any money at all. So, and everybody keeps saying that physical media is dead, but I don't believe that's ever going to happen. To me, they said the same thing about vinyl. And then I heard just a year or two ago, vinyl outsold CDs. So no, it'll never yeah. be dead. So yeah. with Blackout, is there going to be a DVD or Blu-ray release? Absolutely. It's in my Good. contract. I say sure. that there will be a Blu-ray release uh, no matter what. And the other thing is that all of my films, literally all of them, I mean, we're talking about 40 movies, not, not my own, but the films I'm involved in uh, producing, uh, all have fantastic behind the scenes, extensive. In fact, my own films, sometimes the behind the scenes are longer than the movie. I always joke with my crew. I say I the movie we're making is just the supplement to the behind the scenes movie that I'm really making because I believe in the process. I believe in the community, the craft, all the guys, the makeup guys, the art department, all the people that are putting this together, the, the compassion the passion of the actors uh, and the general good times of making a film. And it to me is like represents the idea of a community getting along and making decisions together. I wish the fucking rest of society would work as well as a, a good movie getting made. So I always make an effort. And I also like to share that experience with the fans. And uh, yeah, every movie I've made is comes out on physical media, even if I have to twist someone's arm, which I have, because <laughs> I believe in it. Similarly, oh, I, I, I uh, self-distributed all those old movies. Uh, I made a film called Habit. Mm -hmm. uh, 
you know, I couldn't get into the fancy festivals and the horror festivals weren't as established. This is back in like 95 or six. Right. So uh, it kind of languished. And I was like, you know what? This is absurd. I spend a certain amount of money and a great deal of time and uh, a lot of uh, passion on this. I'm not going to let it lie low because some buyer isn't able to make the leap. So uh, I put it out in theaters. We ended up going to 40 theaters across the country. That's a lot of different cities and towns. We got a lot of good press, and I sort of established this model that I then passed on to these young filmmakers that would come my way, like Ty West. We put The Roost. That was his first film. It was bought by a TV channel, uh, Showtime, actually, a lot of money. But I still put it in theaters first. And um, it's just the idea, you know, we own this genre. We we love this. It's to share with, with others. And... Uh, to have that communal experience. And, you know, we all know we took a hit with COVID and we all know it's fun to watch movies at home alone, but that's not the whole deal. I want to um, celebrate uh, that, that exciting experience of going out to a movie and uh, you know, with your date or with your dudes or all alone, actually, I love going to movies alone mm -hmm. and just having that theater experience. Yeah. Um, and then, in the end, if it ain't on the shelf, I don't feel like I've made it. So I got to get it on uh, Blu-ray. <laughs> Absolutely. I've always been one of those people that always said that, especially being a filmmaker, is that your movies are going to outlive you. So that's that's what, when you put something like that, like you talk about, like your heart, your soul, and your experiences and stuff like that, and you put it in a film, it's nice and it's a great feeling to know that it'll be here long after you're gone. People, long after you're gone, may get a chance to see it and get a little piece of you from that and that's that's a special feeling yeah yeah exactly so i and you know i mean i think we sort of referenced this but i i love the graphics and the art yeah uh, all, all of that is part of uh of what's going on um it's just the generation i'm from you know i made the little monster models uh back in the day aurora uh made all those uh, plastic uh, monsters and mm -hmm. i just uh yeah my whole my whole jam is is populated with these little guys. Uh, I'm just uh, you see mine. <laughs> well, I see yours, man. That's a that's another level. But I I could <laughs> I, I could, uh, I could make you uh, run for your money. <laughs> so, Larry, we got a question in the chat. Are you working on any projects, uh, 2025 and beyond? 2025 2026 is that too far in the future you just take it day by day you got some things planned up uh a little of both everything's day by day you know you got to appreciate the day you can't just uh have everything about the future because it may not come that's always been my feeling <laughs> it's another reason i like horror because it seems to express my outlook on life but listen um well you know, I think I keep referencing this movie, Habit. That was a vampire movie. I made a movie called Depraved. That was a Frankenstein story. I've made a werewolf movie now, and now I have to finish up by having them all in the same movie. <laughs> so I'm going to do a mashup, and I have the script, and i got to find the money, and uh, that'll be, you know, I'll put my little monster verse to, to bed. But uh, not until I've done that. So, yeah, I'm actually ready for production. <laughs> but... Uh, I don't have anything set up and I got to get all my guys back so that it really is a fun uh, experience because it's the same actors and so on. So it's a bit of a project. I usually, uh, you know, wouldn't, wouldn't disclose something like that because it's so easily could never happen, but I'm kind of putting it out there both because I think it's a funny idea um, and also it makes me have to do it uh, or I'll really have egg on my face. But remember, the puzzle is that I don't make uh, horror comedies or sarcastic comedies. This this has to make sense in my monster world, uh, and yet it's absurd to have all three monsters somehow together. So <laughs> it's a fun challenge. I love it. I mean, that sounds great. But it's also, it'll be not just a great little project all on its own, but if it's uh, successful and you and you you bring to life what you're looking to bring to life, that's going to give new life to habit. And the other ones as well. Well, that's right. And that's why I particularly said I need my uh, Blu-ray rights because 
uh, one day uh, there'll be a little box set of all those and you can have your fun with them. <laughs> I'll, I'll have a space picked out for it already. Trust me. <laughs> yeah. You, you I have my own fucking shelf. <laughs> <laughs> It don't look like you You're got starting much space it. over there. <laughs> oh well, okay. Uh, so, man, you you, you know, I, I'm really really looking forward to seeing uh, Blackout. Uh, I, I really am. I really dug the trailer. Um, talk to talk to us just a little bit. Uh, you know, we we've gone over. You know, you mentioned for aspiring filmmakers. You know, the the distribution. Is 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 a pain in the ass. Uh, you made some very good points. Just get out there and get it done. Make it. You don't. You don't need tons of money. Everybody's got an iPhone that shoots. You know, probably 4K on their exactly. video. I mean, yeah, I mean, I got I got an Android that does that that shoots yep. 4K. So you know, the, if if you can't figure out how to do it, that's my phone. <laughs> yeah, there you go. I love it. <laughs> I mean, if you can't if you can't make a movie with the, the the state of technology that we're in, you just don't have the passion. Yeah. But we did touch a little bit on finances, yeah. and yeah, I guess in the beginning, yeah. just to get your feet wet, you may not need a whole lot. But for those directors that maybe have, I don't know, a couple shorts under their belt or whatever, yeah. what? And and do need to raise you know some funds for for actors and and production. Uh, have you tried any of the outlets out that you know now like your Indiegogos, your Kickstarters? Uh, what avenue have you take uh, taken in that regards? Well, I'm I'm from way back when, and uh, I've been financed by you know I guess individuals who were producers and they they had access to money that was a couple of movies were like that other movies i was able to uh put in a certain amount from the well of, of finances that i had and then you find co-financers so actually every movie is different i've never done indiegogo myself but i've been been involved in that and i'm surprised uh how successful that can be. I mean, yeah. in fact, I'm doing a movie in a, in a couple of weeks that seems to have been financed or at least supplemented um, through Indiegogo. And, and, you know, they're getting some names. That's nice. I mean, the thing about horror is that uh, when I was making really, really low budget movies, what I called scare flicks, they were like a little subdivision and we made a whole bunch of them. Uh, we would also, we, we got Tom Noonan to be in Ty West's first movie. Uh, we got uh, Angus Scrim, which is our favorite association. Um, my friend wanted to make this movie. We gave him $35,000 to make it. And, you know, I said, is there anything we can do to make this a little more uh, sparkly for the, for the sale down the line? And, and I said, and he, he said, well, I always wanted Angus Scrim to be in the movie uh, when I wrote it. And I said, well, let's, let's see what's possible. And, and we, we did this scheme where we figured out that Angus was going to be at a convention on the East Coast, you know, in those days, maybe Fangoria Convention or something. And, uh, and we invited him to then travel up to Maine where we were filming and we promised him a lobster dinner and, uh, you know, a couple of shekels. But the point is, is that then we got Angus and first of all, we developed a lifetime friendship. Uh, he was in many of our films after that, but, and was just such a wonderful, gracious gentleman. But we also had the tall man in our movies and that, uh, counts for something. That's we have Michael movie. Rooker in one of our movies, uh, oh, before he was back being famous you know in other words during his down period uh between henry serial killer and days of thunder and then you know he was sort of a little bit around uh, languishing and then of course now he's walking dead but we got him in a movie he was great so it is also if you're trying to scheme uh there are some cool people especially from horror that are not too uh, snooty to uh maybe step up and maybe you get to, they, they don't have to wear the mask this time. So it's a little bit more fun for them. Uh, mm -hmm. House of the devil. We have some wonderful uh, 
uh, actors, Mary Warnoff and so on. So th th there's a couple of things you can, you can do. Uh, everyone knows what's going on. It's not like you're, uh, it's, it's understood why you're calling them and uh, you make a deal. So, you know, this is the other thing. You have to be a little bold how you spend the money. Sometimes you put way too much money towards that one thing. Right. Uh, and then the rest you do in a much more strategic or, uh, you know, very, very modest way. But uh, like, uh, yeah, I've thrown much more money at a single name just to see. Uh, and, and it does help. Very cool. I I had a I had a question and it completely slipped my mind. So Rick, what do you got, buddy? Well, I was just going to ask you. You said you do a lot of the editing, or at least you do now the editing yourself. That you enjoy doing that. What do you use? Uh, well, now I use uh, Adobe Premiere. Okay. I used yeah. to use uh, Final Cut, and then they just dumbed it down. I think most people had this experience with X. Final Cut mm -hmm. X or whatever. Anything that turns to X becomes annoying. <laughs> um, <laughs> so Final Cut X, I just like abandoned it. It, it. it just acted like the only reason you'd be making uh, videos was to post on Instagram. It was it mm -hmm. was disrespectful to the potential of their own product. So I, and even before that, believe it or not, I used the habit briefly. They were... They built too many um, walls to protect their money and as a result became inaccessible. So, you know, uh, but I'm lucky enough to be old enough that I edited on a flatbed uh, yeah. in film, which I love because you really had to know. And I made Super 8 movies when I was little. So, you know, you really have to have a theory about um editing and filmmaking you know if a, if a guy's arm does that and you cut to a close-up do you do you repeat the action do you do you cut in the middle you know all those things you have to actually have theories and i love that about this is a beautiful craft um it and i it, it's nice to and i love you know alfred hitchcock i like talking about the way shots are put together and how you tell your story how you reveal information to the audience and that is why this is such a cool medium um because <laughs> you are trying to manipulate people by revealing the story in a certain way you know you can make a story scary or suspenseful you can do all those things by your choices and so i find all that so thrilling that that occupies my mind yeah um, happily <laughs> i'm just starting to get into editing myself now i've been using davinci which seems to be the popular choice right now oh nice and it really is nice. It's very simple. Uh, and they've got so many features. And the fact that it's free, too, which is crazy. But yeah. um, that's a really good thing. Um, what I was going to ask you, because you mentioned something about um, the effects. And you're a big fan of effects and stuff like that. Yep. And you had a chance, obviously, to work with Marcus, which I, I, I had him on one of my short films, The Pledge. Um, who is your favorite effects person? Not necessarily somebody you worked with, but somebody that you really... You enjoy his work, love his work, idolize them as far as what they do, and why? Who is it? <laughs> Jack Pierce. There you go. My friend Tom Savini, who I'm sure you've heard of. of that's course. His, Jack Pierce, yeah, is uh, is one of his idols. So, I mean, uh, I, I think it's interesting. I actually have read some books on him. He was obviously a bit of a, a, a prick, but, I mean, I think he was – I think he was a man of tremendous integrity and seriousness and uh, – you know, he was pushing the envelope. And and once again, I just remind you, look at the images of yeah. the characters he created. That is beyond uh, putting a putty on an actor's face. That is a, a visionary. I mean, think of the Frankenstein monster, how many iconic elements there are. The flat yeah. head, the, the bolts here, the bolts here, the one scar. I mean, what the hell? How did you come up with this crap? So mm -hmm. it's beautiful. And it's fun to see. Obviously, you've seen the the, the test makeup where the bolts are much bigger and all these little, uh, the minutia that uh, any kind of fan would get into. Um, the werewolf, uh, Bride of Frankenstein. Obviously, you could cite uh, Lon Chaney as well, but it's just the, the fact of the matter that those movies are a bit older and, and less. Um, but, you know, visually, I'm looking at, uh, at the Phantom up there, and then he obviously did uh, so many others, including the Lost film, uh, London and Midnight. Um, so 
so Jack Pierce, but obviously Sabini and um, uh, the dude uh, who did the thing, what's his name, Botini or whatever. Um, oh, I, I know who you're talking about. Yeah, I'm actually terrible. At, well, I can't remember anything anymore. But uh, all these guys, it's such a pleasure. I love the dude. Um, there's, you know, he just made, he finally made his own crazy animation. But, you know, he did the dinosaurs. I love dinosaurs also. I love the whole saga of the way Jurassic Park went from stop motion animation to CGI and, you know, the sort of the tragedy of that. And yet, obviously, incredibly beautiful. Um, so I'm not an anti CG guy, except <laughs> with werewolves. I'm sorry. Yeah. There's a limit. There's a limit. You can't do werewolves with CGI. It's just not it's right an now. insult to uh, humanity. <laughs> yeah. To, to me, werewolf, that, that's why I've held off on my movie because it's really going to have to be. In my movie, one of the things with werewolves is that I've always didn't like the fact that in a lot of werewolf movies, you hardly ever see them. It's a green flash here, a thing of fur there until the very end. I yeah. wanted my werewolf to be a main character and he's in his full glory in the first five minutes. So to do that, he has to look amazing or else the movie's going to fail. And I don't think CGI has gotten to that point yet as far as a werewolf goes. I think that CGI can complement certain aspects. Of course. I think practical effects are definitely the way to go. I mean, it's weird because uh, I'm I'm quite fond of the, uh, you know, it's almost just become a, a family thing around Christmas. We always watch the uh, Peter Jackson King Kong, and obviously they've got the fur. Uh, you you got the performance from um, circus. Everything mm -hmm. is great, uh, and yet I would mistrust a, a similar CGI um, <laughs> werewolf. But I, they also nobody's ever done it. Nobody's tried. The Planet of the Apes, the modern Planet of the Apes movies are very cool, even though we yeah. love the original makeup, and that was its own amazing thing, Roddy McDowell and so on. So blah, blah, blah. I mean, it's a history. You don't want to just be an old stick in the mud, but the fact is is that you want – well, it's also the story that's being told and how it's being told, um, and if CGI is going to serve that, it's cool, uh, uh, whatever. But, but for most physical monsters – I can feel it when it's uh, just all fake. It's fine yeah. to do a little combo. That's obviously the way of the world now. You know, they haven't, I mean, I guess Guillermo made Shape of Water. I, I haven't seen a real creature from the Black Lagoon, anything as cool as that monster. Um, yeah. There you go. And you can still see the zip pleasure. I know. <laughs> I do have a question for you, though. As an old school filmmaker and actor and everything else, this is a debate that I've gotten in many times with people in our in our beloved our genre. What are your thoughts on remakes or reboots? Some people are dead set against them, no matter what. The original is the only one that should be there. And if a remake is made, it damages the original. I've never been somebody like that. I've always thought like the original is there. It will always be there. A remake can only help the original. If the remake is good, it's going to bring new attention to the original. If the remake is terrible, it's going to help you appreciate the original even more. But what are your thoughts on that? Win-win. Uh, I mean, look, I tend to agree. At the same time, with streaming, you're like, wait, The Omen with, uh, you know, The Omen from, whatever, six years ago? Uh, that's The Omen that I'm finding on my streaming? You know, it's mm -hmm. sort of like, so uh, I do, I, I'm not, instantly opposed and i love theme and variation in music i like cover songs you know let's see uh what this guy would do or this gal would bring to uh to a to an old favorite so bring it on i'm all for it i like the uh, the the remake i mean this is random because there's so many to talk about but mm -hmm. i always like the uh dawn of the dead uh remake yes, uh, me too. uh i thought that was really visceral and cool and had some cool thing you know it's they still had the the themes in the in the supermarket or whatever it's called the the mall, yeah. um, but that's just sort of a random example. Obviously, I just cited King Kong. That's already the third King Kong, and I had no, I was not offended. You can always go back to the original; it's remarkably holds up. It and really then, does. And then the eighties one is fun, even though it's the dude in the suit, which is a little like, okay, um, so. <laughs> Yeah, I, you know what? I don't have a principle about it, but I do find that it sort of clutters the the environment. And I hope that 
my real issue is that I don't know if the kids are paying attention. Like, that's a good point. This is the only thing. Like, are they uh, aware? You know, I just feel like film <laughs> history and all the things that have mattered to our generation. I mean, behind you is true fetishizing of these titles and you know what you're dealing with. That That's beautiful. I just worry if the kids are stumbling on a movie and they're not really seeing the real one. Uh, if, if they were in a dialogue saying, I... Uh, the the remake was this and that and i you know then that's fine but i just worry there's something about the modern world that we're kind of erasing history and and that is a bit troubling like night of the living dead i'm sorry is still <laughs> it sounds and you know i don't mind if somebody would disagree but to me it's still the best zombie movie it it's so oh, yeah. uh it's so uh, 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 disarming and and weird and you know of course it's not as slick or cool and there's great other ones um i mean zombies of all things there's a gazillion of them and there's so many good excuse me good ones anyway blah 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 uh but nothing in particular against remakes but a little wary if they're taking over the the classics and that's a good point and i completely agree with that but i'll give you a, a story on the flip side here yeah road warrior mad max oh. i'm a huge fan of what mel gibson did from the beginning yeah. my daughter had no interest. I tried to show her Road Warrior. She had no interest whatsoever. Totally. But then Fury Road comes out with Tom Hardy, and she loves Tom Hardy, and she loved that movie so much that she actually came to me and said, okay, can you show me the original ones? And I showed her. So because of that, she actually wanted to see. Same thing with my son, I Am Legend with Will Smith. Nice. He loved that movie. And because yeah. of that, he asked me, can you show me what came from before? So I went back and showed him the Omega Man. I even went back and showed him the last man on earth with Vincent Price, yeah. which is the original one. He yeah. wanted to see those because of I Am Legend. So excellent, me, that's, excellent that's, example. I yeah. love that example and I completely agree. And I've been, you know, I've been that guy too. Uh, yeah. I don't always see the, the source first and there's nothing better than having a kid able to go back but again you know they're, they're your kids are are open and and yeah. aware of uh of of the history of of something is that will smith called i am legend no it's got enough no it's i am legend yeah mm -hmm. and that, that movie was actually a good movie except yeah. the only part we were talking about with the uh the cgi to me to make the creatures cgi to me made no sense because they were humanoid creatures you yeah. would have saved a shit ton of money just making up some actors as opposed to the cgi and you never felt the dread because you knew there was cgi dude it's worse than that you know it was dude they shot that two blocks from my house on fourth street in manhattan and really? uh and they they had uh put grass in the uh in the pavement to make it look uh broken up it was a big takeover of the neighborhood and not like some weird podunk neighborhood it was kind of like lafayette street in manhattan anyway wow. uh and then we were also hearing that they had hundreds and hundreds of dancers doing the zombies so there is material of like real humans doing some crazy shit. and f i don't know it's the usual thing the studio panicked and then they replaced them with uh, what looks like video game creatures. <laughs> it's, right. It, yeah. it was a mistake. Cause that movie's got a good vibe. It and did. Will, it really did. did. Um, will pre-slap. <laughs> pre <-slap>, um, yeah. <laughs> and uh, you know, the dog and the whole thing. And uh, it's, I like that movie. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, I even read the original book from Matheson. The I am legend. Yeah. That, that's what first got me and started with that whole thing. But, Absolutely. If it wasn't for the CGI creatures, that would have been a very good movie. Yep. I agree. It's still pretty cool. Uh, got a couple comments here before we wrap up about the remake um, topic. Uh, I think you can tell when a remake is just a cash grab or when the yeah. filmmaker really wants to honor the yeah. original. I can't help but agree. Totally. Yeah. That's, uh, that's true. See, we got uh this is this is our dear friend Kelly. Uh her son knows the originals from the remakes. He's only seven. Nice. And, uh, that's good parenting uh, right there. That, that, that is good thing. parenting. <laughs> exactly. Win right there. Absolutely. And uh along those same lines, uh, you know, she thinks that it is important for the younger generation to appreciate the originals to understand where these remakes are coming from, see the original stories, uh, and so on. The love of the original 
really comes across on the screen sometimes chase and ship so uh, and i and i agree yeah absolutely you can Love definitely it. tell when they're just trying to cash in on the name versus you know the love of the <laughs> remake but before, turn, yeah. but before we take and uh because we're right about at our, at our hour mark i do have to throw in one of my favorite remakes you had mentioned night of the living dead i really like tom savini's uh remake of the night of the living dead with bill mosley in it i thought that was really done well it was a little spin on yeah. uh barbara's character she, yeah. was, she was more feisty uh and i thought that 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 was that's probably one of my favorite remakes well it was also incredibly exciting it was actually before the studios were remember her was a bastard child for well into the 80s and Absolutely. so that movie as you know was they were trying to get their copyright back i mean i'm sure they had their own version of passion for the material and you know they they it was so identifiable with them, but uh, that I agree. That was really exciting when it happened, and like you say, Barbara manned up a little bit. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> uh, from, did. from I, the I, first I, Barbara. I like to spin on it because you know the original. As much as I love that one, and I agree with what you said, I think that's the best zombie movie out there. Um, <laughs> you know, Bar Barbara was a little catatonic the entire movie. Um, I'll say. I thought there could have been a little bit more going on with Barbara. So, no, I really did like the uh, you know, Tom Savini's uh, take on it. Larry, this has been a fun conversation, yes, my has. friend. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much for taking <laughs> the time out. Uh, we're not rushing you out, but uh, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll take, you know, when we end. You can, you can sit there. We like to say bye to our guests uh, off the show. But uh, thank you so much, my friend. Where, where can people uh, do a little link drop for us if you have any place for people that can uh, keep up on uh, what's going on in Larry's world. Absolutely. Well, check out Glass Eye Picks, G-L-A-S-S-E-Y-E-P-I-X, -S -S -E -E and we keep that updated. And, uh, you know, that's also on Instagram and, I guess, uh, uh, Twitter, X, uh, what have you, and so on and so on. But Glass Eye Picks is my company, and that way you don't only have to hear about me. You can see uh, – our big extended family of awesome filmmakers uh, who uh, we keep track of as they uh, continue on in their journeys. Awesome. That's awesome. Well, thank there you for joining us. Uh, picks. Uh, yeah. Any finishing uh, last thoughts, uh, Rick? No, I'm just so glad we had a chance to talk with us. I wish this show was two hours, but thank you so much. We'll drop you into the green room real quick, say our goodbyes, and then we'll join you. Thank you. Man, All right. that, 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 uh, that hour went too fast. It really did. I kept looking up. I'm like, wait a minute. We got 30 minutes left. Hold on. Wait a minute. We, we got five <laughs> minutes left. Uh, for those, we got uh, we got a few more people in the chat. You had a special little uh, something, something going on next oh, yeah. week because uh, next Wednesday, the new magazine drops. What do you got lined up? Because it's people are going to have to put their thinking caps on. You're bringing some indie horror trivia. What are they going to get? Tell yeah, us what's going to win. Basically, what we're going to do is next week, which is the 13th, that's the actual drop date for the digital version of the new magazine, as well as the print magazine being available for sale. So what we're going to do to honor that, since it falls on the same day as our podcast, is we'll come on here, we'll do a little indie horror trivia, one question, maybe two, and the winners of those will send you out a magazine for free so you can uh, join the family. There you go. That's awesome. That's awesome. I want to thank uh, everyone in the chat who uh, joined us. A lot of great comments. Uh, and I want to thank everyone who is going to watch this on the replay. Hopefully you see it before next Wednesday. So you can get you one of them handy dandy magazines. Absolutely. Uh, but until then, you know what they say in the biz there, Ricky. Yes, sir. We'll see you next Wednesday. <laughs>